Hey everyone, welcome back to Big Strong Book. I'm Reed, and today I'm going to be talking about Père Goriot by Honoré de Balzac. This is the first novel that I've read in Balzac's uh, human comedy. Not even going to attempt to pronounce uh, the French original of that title, um, but the human comedy is how I'm going to refer to his whole uh, magnum opus series in this video and in other videos to come because I do want to read uh, more of his work. This novel, uh, I did not read this translation. I actually read uh, the one of the translations that's in the public domain. I'm blanking on the, the name of the translator right now. Um, but this novel, uh, you know, if, if you're familiar with mid 19th century, uh, I'll just say European novels include, you know, French language, English language, uh, novels of that time period, you, you've seen stories similar to this before, but um, I don't want to call uh, Balzac the originator of this kind of a story, but he is certainly one of the uh, more original um, practicers or practitioners uh, of the, the, the style, meaning something that where you have these kinds of fully developed characters fully developed in such a way that they, you know, to us today might seem more of an archetype, uh, but yet it's still, it's still a very original uh, flow of original um, characters. It's, it's hard, it's hard to, uh, to, to describe it in, in such a way. It's very panoramic. Uh, it, it's Balzac's attempt to paint this picture of um, society's influences on individuals, and he structured most of his works into the human comedy uh, series, so novels, short stories, novellas, um, more philosophical nonfiction texts. Uh, that's as far as I understand it. I believe that the whole series encompasses around 90 or so total complete works with, I believe, dozens of um, works that were incomplete when he died at, I believe he was only 50 or 51 um, when he died. But, you know, he, I, I think I had read a story where when Balzac finally figured out the idea for this huge uh, panoramic series and how a lot of his works that he had already written, he decided to kind of incorporate into as part of the series. And I think I'd read a story that when he got the idea, he ran over to his sister's house and was like, I have it, like, th this is it, this is the, this is the ultimate idea, this is the, the, well, like, the, the best artistic vision he um, had gotten before that. And, you know, what drew me, I think, to Balzac first was hearing about the influence that he had had on writers such as Victor Hugo, um, which I guess maybe Victor Hugo's influence, maybe that's not as much. I know he and Victor Hugo were contemporaries, um, but certainly the influence that he had on Flaubert and Dickens and Henry James, uh, Emile Zola, uh, writers like uh, those people, you know, that where Balzac, I think when they read his work, it really touched something uh, in their mind and in how stories could work and what stories could do and what novels in particular could do. Um, so the plot of this novel, I, you know, it's, if, if you're familiar with Shakespeare's play King Lear, um, it is similar in many respects to that. You have uh, an old man, the, the title character, uh, who is known uh, kind of in a, you know, sardonic, uh, sarcastic, and mean-spirited way at first. He's known as uh, Father 
uh, Goryeo by other tenants in this boarding house in which he lives. So Goryeo, again, an, old, an older man that ha seemingly has uh, great wealth, but he lives very frugally um, and lives more and more frugally as time goes on. And in the, um, I, I, I forget the exact name, name of the, um, the, the woman who is the head of this boarding house, she kind of views him in a negative light, doesn't understand why a guy like him is living in such a modest house, such as hers in a boarding house with over a dozen, a dozen and a half other people, you know, almost 20 others. And um, those in the boarding house, there's kind of an eclectic group of characters and they view him, uh, you know, bringing over to the boarding house these young women who Goryeo says are his daughters, but they're convinced that he's just kind of this, you know, creepy old rich guy who is swindling and seducing these much younger women. But Goryeo maintains these, these are my daughters, these are my daughters. And uh, he is the subject of the butt of many jokes in the boarding house particularly led off by this other mysterious character named uh, Vatrin. And Vatrin is another man who seems to have a great deal of wealth and who has a very pessimistic view of society and view, you know, he's very much so a, a villain type character that views humans and individuals as pieces on a board that he can move forward to achieve greater ends for himself. Um, and in the midst of it all is this young uh, man named uh, Eugene uh, Rostignac. I'm, I, again, I could be butchering uh, the last name, but I'll just refer, I'll, I'll say Rostignac and hope that that is close to how it's actually pronounced. Um, he is a law student who uh, comes from a family that is on the, the poorer side, but you know, they're the, like his sisters, I think have kind of married up in society. And he knows that he has to make the most of his time in Paris. He has to use um, society and gain a foothold within it. Uh, so he can kind of um, propel forward his professional aims, his personal aims, you know, the thinking, and he thinks about the the type of women, or the type of woman that he, he wants to pursue, um, the type of influence almost that he wants to have. And he has a cousin in Paris, and she... Uh, introduces him in many respects to society and he's an extremely or he starts out as a he's a very naive character he's very easily uh taken in under the influence of others such as his cousin such as uh Vautrin, and in some respects such as uh Goryeo as well and he falls in love with this woman at first and then realizes that this woman is uh Goryeo, one of Goryeo's daughters, and they have a very strained relationship. Um, and he also starts to pursue another woman who is Goryeo's other daughter. And Goryeo eventually uh, realizes this. And the kind of the, the truth, the sad reality of Goryeo's relationships with his daughters uh, come to light. And Rostignac, he's caught in the middle of this, and Vautrin realizes this and tries, you know, to manipulate him forward. He knows that Rostignac, he wants the recognition from society. He wants great wealth. He wants, you know, however cliche it might sound, he wants to be somebody. Um, and so he's open to all avenues in order to pursue what he knows he wants. And there, Rostignac is, in many respects, right there with Goryeo as kind of the kindred spirits of the novel, the heart and soul of the novel. But 
he is his view, of course, I mean, every character has to grow in some way throughout the course of a great novel, and his does, and he is almost mortified by what he sees, very saddened by, what the, I guess, the, the truth that is unveiled as Balzac continues weaving this tapestry of um, Parisian society the, the the deeper kind of darker but yet it's it's you know it's it's not dark in a, in an evil type of way it's just dark in a in a sad type of way how people will use one another to gain things and the almost the humanness that is stripped away the further one tries to play this game even if it is for the best of intentions Gorio has a strained relationships with his daughters mainly because of um, their marriage, their husbands kind of forbid, you know, contact with Gorio, and they're kind of leeching off of the great money that Gorio has given his daughters over the years, and they're trying to siphon even more, and Gorio, of course, wants to support his daughters, and yet, you know, they start, you know, and it, but it, but it's very complex, it's, I found it a little contradictory at times, but that was the point with the relationships that his daughters have with him. It's supposed to be complex, contradictory. You know, they're they're struggling with how they view their father, with the, the type of relationship that they want to have with him. The ideal is something that they can't achieve. Um, and so, again, they're, they're always struggling with it. They're always trying to, to figure things out. But then where they end up at the end of the novel in a, in a, in a final, in the, in the final state that they could reach with their father is, again, it's just, it's, it's supposed to be sad. And Rostignac is witness to all of this. And I mean, the, just, I'm, I'm just thinking, and I won't say what it is for, for the sake of those who haven't read the novel, but, um, when Rostignac, you know, he, he's, he's taking in all of Paris at the end um, and just the, the things that are going over um, in his mind. I guess I just, you know, gave away a little bit of the ending, but uh, I mean, this novel's almost 200 years old too. So um, it's, yeah, I, you know, this is, it's the type of not it, you know there, there's such a a depth to the level of of the the, the painting that uh, and the, again as I've mentioned the the, the tapestry the panorama the panoramic whatever you want to call it that Balzac is creating is immense and having read a few things by Henry James for example I 100% see the influence and how Balzac is almost Balzac, Balzac, and I realize I'm, you know, going back and forth, whatever. That Balzac is in many respects almost the original, but of course Balzac, I'm sure, had his great many um, influences himself. And one of the other things, I mean, kind of unrelated to this novel that I admire about Balzac, of course, the, the many things that one hears about him is his legendary writing habit of, you know, writing potentially more than 16 hours a day, 50 cups of coffee, obsessively editing and revising his works. You know, you definitely get the sense of wanting to make the most of one's mortality within this. Rostignac is a prime example of that. Gorio is almost in many respects past that and can just kind of wallow in his reality in, in a very saddening way. Balzac, I think, was the same way with always trying... He was writing as if he was always running up against the clock. And perhaps in an ironic way, his incessant and unceasing, you know, is his, his writing style and writing habits may have greatly contributed to 
his um, relatively young death, his death at the age of 51, I believe. That comes through in this work, and, and because this is the first thing, you know, story, whatever, that uh, by him that I've read, um, I'm very much so interested in kind of going through the rest of the human comedy and seeing how the, the tapestry, as I've seen it within this, is extended. Um, I'm not sure exactly what will be the next work in the human comedy that I will uh, read, whether it be Lost Illusions or, uh, you know, uh, Eugenie uh, Grande, I think is the name of the book, or um, Cousin uh, Beth or Betty. Uh, there, there's a lot, there's a, I mean, there's, you know, 90 works to choose from here, and there's a lot of varied opinions as to the best order most orders of the human comedy suggest to start with this novel. And so that's that's why I've I've done that. Um and I know that characters like Vautrin and Rostignac, they they appear in other works within the human comedy, so it'll be interesting to see how their arcs either preceded this if they were mentioned if they were featured in works that were written before this or that take place before this novel or works that uh, last far afterwards. So uh, this, this novel has, I think, one of the highest recommendations that I can give, very good, and I am excited to see uh, where the rest of the paths of the human comedy go. So let me know what you guys think of Per Goriot, and I will see you guys next time.